Thanks, JP, and good afternoon. Come From Away has become one of Broadway's biggest hits. David Hine and Irene Sankoff's emotionally fulfilling and joyful musical of hope and optimism and the greatness of the human spirit has audiences on their feet at the end of every performance. It tells the story of a city of Gander in Newfoundland that in the days following the terrorist attacks of 9-11 sheltered thousands of air passengers whose flights had been grounded there. So please welcome the creators and cast of this remarkable musical, David Hine and Irene Sankoff, who wrote the book, Music and Lyrics. And the cast, Jen Colella, Joel Hatch, Hugh Smith, and Gino Carr, the company of Come From Away. Welcome everybody. Well, I'd like to start things off with Irene and David. It has been quite a journey bringing Come From Away to Broadway. Is it still surreal, or have you been able to put part of it into perspective? No, it's completely surreal. It's, it's we're having a very strange dream, and we're gonna wake up tomorrow and be like, we had this lovely panel, and then... <laughs> Um, no, it's, it's, been, it's been an incredibly wonderful experience. We, we never expected the show would come to Broadway. We, uh, we wanted to tell the story that we fell in love with about uh, Newfoundlanders being kind to people, uh, to be, being kind to the world, and uh, you know, welcoming them into their homes and giving them everything in the backdrop of 9-11. And we expected you know, Canadian uh, high schools to do it. <laughs> and, uh, and now we're on Broadway performing with you know, amazingly talented performers with an incredible team, and it's, uh, it's, it's a joy every day to, to be sharing this. And it just continues to get more and more surreal every day. Then the Prime Minister comes, and then Hillary Clinton comes, and then, you know, it's, um, it's a really wonderful experience. Irene, for you. I, I've, I've just been completely amazed the entire way from the time that we got uh, our show at La Jolla Playhouse, because I remember speaking to my dad about, you know, what we were doing, that the show was going to go to the States, and we weren't going to stay in Canada like we thought we were. And, and, um, and I, I was talking about different regional theaters, and I said, you know, we'll never, we'll never be asked to do La Jolla. And then, and then there's La Jolla. And then, <laughs> you know, and then we're, cross we're crossing the entire continent, Washington up to Toronto. We were in Seattle, obviously, as well, same continent. And then going out to Gander. I mean, it, I mean, and that was totally surreal, too, because I could tell that everyone we'd interviewed in Gander was kind of like looking at us like, you didn't tell us this would happen. Like, you know, and we're like, we didn't know. So, yeah, every step has been surreal. Yeah. For the cast, you all play real life people. How tricky is it playing a living person and having them present while you're perfecting it during rehearsal? Tricky. <laughs> You know, it's mostly, uh, there's a sense of responsibility, right? Um, I, I play Captain Beverly Bass. She has seen the show over 75 times at this point. Um, so I'm getting used to it. <laughs> um, but there is, there's a great feeling of responsibility. I want to honor her, and I want to honor her story. And uh, it's quite surreal to, a lot of our, our stuff is direct address. So to see her while I'm singing about her, and to watch her react to me playing, I'm like, I wasn't trained for this. Like, I, it's, it's, it's something else. I was, I was fairly lucky because Claude Elliott, when he first came to see us in Seattle, um, when he first met me, he said, I want you to relax. He said, it's not about me. It's not about portraying me. It's about telling a story of Gander. And he said, that's what I'm most concerned about. And I said, then I think we're on really good ground. And after the show, um, he was exhilarated and very happy. And that just took all the pressure in the world off of me. Uh, he just allowed me to tell the story, which was great. Yeah, uh, we, I didn't meet my person until a few days before opening night. And so the cool thing about our director, our director Christopher, Tony Award winning Christopher yeah, right. Ashley. Tony Award winner for Come From Away. <laughs> he gave us so much freedom to just uh, explore, you know, these characters. And he, he definitely told us not to imitate or become, you know, exactly who they are. Um, I play Hannah O'Rourke. Um, and we are quite different um, in, in our looks, I should say. She's a tiny little Irish woman, it's so sweet. Um, but and you're not sweet? <laughs> well, you Don't know. say that about yourself, we love you. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that was the beautiful thing, is having so much freedom during rehearsal to just sort of find our own thing, you know. Um, 
to tell these stories beautifully. But Hannah's so lovely, she invited us all over to her house for a barbecue next month. And I am looking forward to getting to know her even better. Yeah. I think it's been amazing the, the amount of love that's come back at us from the people of Gander and the people that, that come from a ways that we also portray. They all are so proud um, of, of the stories that are being told uh, that David and Irene have, have put together into this you know, magical piece of theater that I, I've never felt any pressure or, uh, or uh, you know, fear of doing it. I just felt that there's so much love coming at us and pride that it's, it's really fueled our performances. And I think we're just as loving and proud of it now as, as they have been since 9-11 you know, years ago. And, and Gino is now a, uh, a honorary constable. Uh, or, uh, yes, thank for, you, David. Um, I am <laughs> for Gander. <laughs> we got to talk about that parking ticket. Um, no, I am. I'm an honorary municipal police officer in the town of Gander, Newfoundland. Now, yes, thank you so much. Thank you. That's wonderful. Yes. It's also your Broadway debut, right? It is my Broadway debut. Yeah, not a bad place to start, huh? Yeah. Jeez. Because I remember speaking to all of you on opening night. We talk about another surreal evening. Everybody who was portrayed in the show from Gander was there on the red carpet and there that opening night. It was one of the most coldest days in New York. And they had ball gowns on, remember? Yes. No coats. And they were like, I was freezing. That's why I got my Gander hat. But they were like, we're used to this up there. <laughs> But it must have been so great to have had them there during the whole process, but to have them there opening night on Broadway for this incredible journey. They surprised us. The creative team and, yeah. the, and the producers surprised us. We didn't know as we were taking our bows, they, they each came out um, oh. one by one. And so it was really quite emotional and beautiful. And uh, they're, they're definitely family members now yeah. as well. It was, it was probably one of the best experiences of all, is it, because at the end, you know, people are applauding you guys justifiably, but but then this New York audience yeah. applauded everyone from Candor for yeah. what they did, and and that that means the world to us. That's yeah. that's why we did it, is to celebrate, you know, what they did, and and to see that down here and to be commemorated by that. That yeah. means the world. Because I remember at the opening night party, Screech is the drink of Gander in right. Newfoundland? Sure. They drink a lot of things, but it's one thing. So explain to the audience what is Screech. We had it that night. We had it at the opening night party. What is Screech? Uh, it's rum. Okay. okay. Yeah. It's, it's got a little spice in it, but it's basically rum. And, uh, and if you buy really cheap rum and you put the spice in, it's not terrible. <laughs> so uh, that's what Screech is. That is debatable. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You don't drink it by the pint, and I learned that the hard way. <laughs> and it's part of it, it's part of a ceremony that they have called a screech in, which is uh, uh, you have to do a, a number of different things, and it changes uh, the the places you do them in. But basically, you become an honorary Newfoundlander. And uh, Irene and I have uh, have been screeched in three times, and and when we brought these guys out uh, there, I think we had the largest screech in event possible. There, there was like. It was like 70 or 80, 80 something. 80 something people screeched in all at once. All of them had to kiss a fish. All of yeah. them, you have to eat things. You have to say things. It's, um, it's a thing. Uh, <laughs> and you have to drink screech. So you're bonded for life, all of you, right? Yes. Well, for David and Irene, you conducted hundreds of interviews while researching this show. How painstaking were they to narrow down? And how did you choose which characters to highlight in the show? Oh my gosh, it was, it was horrendously painstaking. Um, and uh, in our first draft, it was 100 pages before people even got off the plane because there's just so many stories to tell. Um, and then uh, how did we do it? You know, we, we spread out all of the stories in this cabin uh, in, well, it's not quite northern Ontario, but north enough. Um, and we put stories of food in a pile, like relationships in a pile. And then we decided early on that it wasn't a documentary, like we were going to have to like amalgamate characters if we wanted to include all the stories we wanted to include. And we really did try to include as many as possible. Like even in some of the town hall scenes, like people are yelling out one line. And, you know, that there, there was like four pages on some of those lines in, in a particular draft. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a story about uh, the air traffic controllers had nothing to do because there was nothing flying for five days, so they made chili constantly for everyone. And, uh, and so we wanted to get that in there, and it used to be several scenes, and uh, it eventually got whittled down to one character's line saying, I brought some chili for you. And, uh, and, <laughs> but, but it was important to us to get that in there because yeah. the air traffic controllers come and they sit in the audience and they say, you got in the chili, you know? <laughs> and, and, they, and it's, you know, we're recognizing that they did that. Yeah. When you began writing Come From Away, were there other shows that helped you sort of imagine how you might structure the musical or the narrative? 
Yeah, um, we thought about Laramie a yeah. lot. Um, seeing Peter and the Starcatcher made me look at how you can be um, doing direct address in one moment and then put yourself into a scene. Yeah. Um, once, of course, is a different type of musical. So we're like, okay, so there's room to do things differently, to not do things by the book. And then there, there, there was a moment we saw um, a chorus line up in Stratford, and uh, and I was sitting there with Irene, and Irene was mouthing every single word from it. And I was like, how do you know? Well, I'd never seen it before. And uh, and Irene had clearly seen it 10 million times and knew, million knew every times. word. And, yeah. uh, and I realized that even though I hadn't seen it, it had been, you know, our show, which is direct address and based on interviews, is based on, uh, you know, uh, you know. A narration and another song, like at the ballet in particular, like there's a lot of repetition and yeah. narration amidst the chorus. And yeah. 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 At what point during the process of writing the show, was the structure finalized? Like, we have our show now. Are we good? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. We're from night right? before we opened. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like we made a million changes along the yeah. way, and yet, and yet, the structure of the show was was uh, was mostly the same. The biggest change that that happened was uh, we cut out an intermission from it, uh, and and that was our producers coming to us and suggesting that uh, the people who were in Gander at the time, the people who were stuck in Newfoundland, and, and the people of Newfoundland, no one had a chance in the middle of these five days to stop in the middle and you know go use the washroom and have a drink and say, how do you think it's going? Do you want to leave? Do you, what do you want to do? You know? um, so it, it was an experience that we wanted to bring the audience on from the beginning to the end. And that was, that was one of the biggest changes. But I, I think we've, we've debated every single word. Yeah. And let's talk about your Tony Award winning director. I mean, Christopher Ashley has so much to do with this show and your musical uh, choreographer, Kelly Devine, and mm -hmm. your musical director. I mean, talk about working with them. They're fabulous, and I, I think uh, Chris must be one of the most patient men in the world. He gave us a note for two years that we didn't figure out how to do till like just before Broadway, and he was just really like, "Okay, well, you'll get it or you won't." And and you know, even at La Jolla, he was like, "You know, we'll we'll get this about eighty percent right. We figure out here, and then we're going to rework it again." And David and I were like, "What do you mean? <laughs> it has to be perfect yesterday." And you know, just just really patient with us as we were figuring ourselves out. Um, and Kelly, Kelly is brilliant. Kelly has like a little chart in her head, like her, like her spatial ability on the stage to like know that the stage is spinning and that those spike marks that look like, you know, uh, it's like the top of a, like a constellation yeah. turned upside down, mm -hmm. you know, she knows where they're gonna land. Glad that's not my job. Um, yeah, and just, just they're both brilliant. Yeah, and Ian Eisendrath, our, our ranger and music supervisor, um, uh, he's incredible. He had never heard any Newfoundland music before we started this process. He dove in uh, with both feet tied. That's the lyric from our show. Uh, and uh, now knows more Newfoundland bands than I have ever uh, listened to. And I grew up on Newfoundland bands. Uh, he learned to play accordion and harmonium for it. Then he realized that uh, that the uh, regular accordion wasn't enough. He learned to know, need button accordion. He knew, needed to know how to tune the reeds of the accordion, uh, and he has uh, led us on a really amazing musical journey representing not just getting Newfoundland music right, but also bringing, uh, bringing the world of music there so that we're combining to create this sort of musical metaphor, uh, not only contrasting hand drums from Newfoundland, but hand drums from, uh, from the Middle East, uh, but then also layering them on top of each other so that we create this, this piece that's stronger together, yeah. that, you know, which is what happened there. Just the band he put together oh, yeah. um, with uh, uh, a f an Irish fiddler from Alaska and, uh, and uh, 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 a wind uh, player from um, where he's, he's Liverpool. Liverpool, yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, it just and an old rocker, you know, on the on the guitar. Yeah, Bowron player from Newfoundland. Bowron player from from Newfoundland. It's it's an amazing group of of musicians, all at the top of their game, who are just playing brilliantly together. Yeah. And August Erickson's orchestrations. Yeah. Uh, we're we're so blessed to have him. He did Bright Star right before, which yeah. was such a huge. Um, you know, another like once another point of saying, oh, we can bring this this you know this music that's been around for hundreds of years that that I've loved since I was a kid and put it on a Broadway stage and it sounds like something you've never heard before. It's really mm -hmm. exciting. Sure. For the cast, you all play numerous people. When you were cast, did you know which roles you were going to play? Yes. Ish. Yeah. Yeah. Ish. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, uh, yeah. Go ahead, Q. I auditioned. Um, for all of the women, ex actually, except Beverly Bass's part. So I, I think they were still, you know, in the developmental stages and not sure exactly how they wanted to place us. Yeah. Um, and then I kept getting callbacks that week um, and being called in for Hannah. 
and I think we finally made it happen. There were, like, for instance, I knew Claude, yeah. but um, then the first day we did our first reading, there were things that were assigned to us that I really didn't know I was supposed to read, but it was like, oh, that'll be interesting to read in front of 100 guests who are watching this first read. <laughs> and so that was, that was an interesting experience. But, but yeah, there were a lot of little tiny characters I played, didn't have a clue about, but, you know. We figured it out. That's half the fun of the yeah. show is that we do get to play so many different characters. We all have primary and or maybe secondary characters, but I think I have eight named characters, yeah. not to mention air traffic controllers and guy in the stage left of the spear or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. But, you know, <clears throat> to get a chance as an actor to play all those different roles and every day some, they'd be like, well, why, why, don't you, why don't you try reading this and do it in this dialect and try it this way. It's a, such a challenge but also such a rewarding process to get to play and create this, this interesting tapestry of, of people that all came together. Um, so it's uh, a, a fun challenge for sure. Just to be clear, there are no spear carriers in this show. Thank you. <laughs> I, was just, I was just referencing the world of... But we had, and opera. we had some characters that were switched around after we started yes, rehearsals yes. just because of how it was all yeah. traffic flowy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah, yeah, we occasionally were, we'd be workshopping it and suddenly we'd be like, oh, you're talking to yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we need to fix this. Yeah, for those of you who've seen the show, it's just 12 of you up there, right? Yes. yes. On 12 chairs, it's brilliant the way this show works, but you're, I'm in awe of everything you all do because you're a flawless ensemble. Thank you. And I was wondering what that whole rehearsal process was like, was saying, what chair am I in now? Do the oh chairs switch? God. Do all your positions The chairs switch? are so much harder than oh. switching characters. The character <laughs> switch is fun for actors. Yes. Like, that's what we do. Yeah. Like, we're, that's where we get to show off a little bit. Different accents, different centers of gravity, different characters. That's the fun part. The trickier part are those chairs. Yeah. Uh, and if you mess up one mm -hmm. chair, there is a domino effect. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're going to mess up a lot of your colleagues and friends uh, down the line. So that is actually... That, that's a little more harrowing. I would go home with headaches. I, I've never been so challenged in my whole career. And at the end of the day, I was so proud of myself and proud of my peers because I've never experienced anything like it. You know, every day I go into work and I can't believe this is my job and that we were successful and made it through rehearsals and made it through La Jolla and made it through. It's just, it's, it's unbelievable. It's an unbelievable uh, process. Well, I think the fact that we've gotten to do it together that the cast has basically, for all intents and purposes, been together for two years, doing the show, refining the show, uh, as David and Henry were talking about. So there's a comfortability and a, uh, a, a codependency in the best way possible, where we rely on each other. And if someone does screw up a chair, you know there's going to be trouble, but you can go, oh, I can fix that for you. Or I can make sure I hand you this prop. So it's the way it's staged and created and, and performed is such a family ensemble nature that it's there's something so um, safe and rewarding about it we take care of each other and we breathe together now yeah now oh, it's that's second nature now we're slick about it that's i think one of the most moving things about the show is hearing the cast breathe together um one of my favorite things from the swings that have gone on we've had quite a few times that um the understudies for the show have gone on currently we have three um, going on this week and they've been brilliant but they all say we all feel the shove with love because if you're if you're starting for the wrong chair there's that very nice hand yeah. that guides you to the other chair to move so it's that's yeah, everybody yeah Tony, Tony talks about you, you need to move there's, there's different levels of pressure you need to move two inches that way and then they're saying you're gonna get hit by a chair yeah, yeah. <laughs> go, go 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 now go now yeah that's got to be incredible to have like a certain amount of covers who are covering all these roles. Unbelievable. Yeah. I can't yeah. Our jobs are hard. The theirs are 10 times harder. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, each one knows five, I think five yeah. of the 12 wow. principal roles. Really so they're not just sort of the standard swing who comes in and covers a couple tracks. And no. uh, not that that's not easy either, but to cover five principal roles in a Broadway show, in a show like ours, which is so specific and intricate and, and uh, you know, detailed, it's, it's, I don't know how their brains work and God bless them. Yeah. Well, you wrote the book, Music and the Lyrics. David and Irene, what is your collaboration process like? Do you have rules when you write? Uh, so we're married for anyone who hasn't, hasn't figured that out. Uh, and we have... Uh, yeah, right. Still, yeah. Right. Uh, still. Love you. Uh, and we have a daughter. So there's, there's a lot of things that you learn about conflict, conflict resolution um, along that, that road. Um, yeah, we have rules. Uh, uh, we, don't, um, we don't talk about the show when we're hungry or when we're angry or when we're tired. 
Uh, we try not to talk about the show in bed. That's <laughs> general mood killer. Um, uh, but in general, like, but at the end of the day, I mean, people have people have said, "Wow, that must be really hard," and it is really hard. It's hard to work with your uh, with your partner, um, uh, and it's not for the faint of heart. But at the end of the day, it's I, I actually can't imagine doing it with anyone else. I mean, at the end of the day, we you have someone who's uh, completely honest with you, uh, who loves you, who you know. Uh, is is going to tell you this is terrible what you have just written and I still love you you know uh, and that it, it means the world it's it's the best it's the best way to to write a musical I love that like they said they're married they have a young daughter and you create shows how do you find that perfect balance do you write every day no no okay. we don't write every day um, it's impossible uh, even even before we were. We came to Broadway. Between all the stops, we still had day jobs that we were doing, and and a daughter who was growing exponentially. So it it, it just there is no balance. And I remember actually one of my mentors once said that to me. I, you know, we were having lunch, and and I was like, you know, I, we're just trying to get that work life balance, trying to figure it. And she just stopped me. She said, there is no balance. There's only imperfection. And just 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 embrace that, and then you'll be so much better. And and we really were. Like we just take every day as it comes and, and you know, try to plot things out. But there's always something that's going to get a, like if things are going too well, I just kind of, I just kind of know Molly's going to come home and throw up, you know, like it's just, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> and that's the end of that. And there you I'll go. also say, like we, we say time and again, it takes a village to raise a child and it takes a huge village to raise a new musical while raising a child. And, and everyone on stage has played with Molly and tickled Molly and run her around and sat with her and it, it, like she calls. I'm Uncle Jen. Yeah. <laughs> She loves them. She calls she calls them her people. Uh, uh, Chris Ashley, one of the first we 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 took Chris and our producers out to Newfoundland uh, right when we started working with them. And one of the first experiences that I had with Chris Ashley uh, was installing a baby seat into this rental car, and it took like what felt like five hours with my with this you know Broadway director, and I'm like he's gonna quit. <laughs> You're all aunts and uncles, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I love that. You know, this musical touches audiences on so many human levels. Why do you think audiences are embracing this musical so? It's, it's a, because it's a true story about kindness. And yeah. right now, especially in the current political climate, um, being mean has become the norm. And spewing vitriol has become completely acceptable. And uh, that's not what we were taught when we were kids, it's nice to be nice. And we are all genuinely good at heart. And this musical is reminding us of that. We need to, I don't care what side you're on, we need to stop being mean to each other. It's as simple as that. And people Beautiful. are remembering uh, that kindness is very, very important. It's, it's interesting, uh, the people that tell us, I, and it's the, it's generally people who have had a close connection with the World Trade Center or with the, um, the Pentagon uh, tragedies who say, I had to force myself to come down and see this, and I'm so glad I did. And I think that there is a certain amount of healing uh, that people find when they learn that they're not alone in the world. And I think that's an important uh, story that can be told many times over in many different ways about many different experiences. And it reads true and it's important to hear every time. And the educational aspect of this is quite important. You know, the people that did live through it and were around, they have children now and that were not around. And so they bring their children and they come, like I met a kid last night who was just in tears, JT, the one who <laughs> out the window. Uh, he walked me home basically and uh, he's 19 and he was just like I was you know so floored and now I just I feel changed and I want to do something I want to be a better person and I'm like wow if there's anything that this show um, you know this show speaks on so many levels but that 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 one thing about just changing the world or being a better person that that really stands true and really strong um, especially in the young people and that's what a great what a great message you know I think the show walks a, a, a great tightrope of the, the emotionality and the healing balm of, of the goodness of Gander against the backdrop of the terrible events of that day. But it's also so funny 
people nine, nine times a day. I'm like, I had no idea it would be this much fun. Or I'd be crying while laughing and going back and forth. Mm -hmm. David and Irene and then our whole artistic team have crafted this amazing journey that audiences get to go on with us every night. And they leave feeling all the feels, we say. You know, they've ridden this amazing roller coaster ride of emotion and fun and joy and laughter and pain and, um, and healing that is unlike any other show out there. I'm a little biased about this, but I think it's unlike any other show out there. And I think that that's one of the reasons why the audiences do react so viscerally and so emphatically because it is so different and it gets right into your soul and it, it doesn't let you go for an hour and 40 minutes and you leave feeling all the, all the feelings. And there's a, a ripple effect, I think, that many people feel leaving that theater, feeling re-energized and re-inspired in, in the goodness of the human spirit. For you too. I think we've gotten so used to seeing horrendous things and we've become so desensitized to that that it, it, people are just shocked to see something that's like amazingly, incredibly good. Like it's just, it's like, like good in the sense of, you know, people who are looking after each other. And I spoke to one person who just, you know, like it spent the entire time waiting for the other shoe to drop. You know, and it was like, well, well, no, you know, we did our research out there and yes, people were uncomfortable and yes, people were sad and people were scared. But at, at the same time, like th there was no riots. I mean, this is the other thing. We always say how nice the Gander people are, but they were really also so brave and so smart, you know, like to, to take people in and instead of having 7,000 scared, angry, um, tired people, hungry people, they, they had people who, who came off the planes and made friends. You know, and they and they did the best they could to take care of them. Not not because you know, you know. I think nice is sometimes confused with naive, and there's no naivete. I mean, it, it there really isn't. Like if you sit in a room with someone from Newfoundland, they're reading you the entire time. You know, yeah. like and and they know when to crack a joke, and they know when to show you the door, and you know, like it's it's yeah. it's. And I, and I don't want that to get lost. And I think I think people are interested in that. Like they're they're like, oh, that's it's just not something we see often. David, for you. I think for me, I mean, we we went out there and we were inspired by it, and and and, and something that changed us. It made us want to be better people. It made us want to tell the story. It made us, you know, we got invited into people's homes and they fed us for days and they screeched us in and they, you know, they they literally just gave us the keys to their house and said, uh, strangers gave us the keys to the house and they said, just feed the cats. We'll be we'll be at the cabin. You can stay here, and. I don't. It, it reminded me of like not locking my door when I was a kid. It reminded me that uh, the in, in, and when we were out there, it wasn't in, it wasn't at a time of crisis. It was, it was a ten year anniversary. Uh, they didn't have to do that, and and it it just it reminded me that uh, and Jen talks about this that we can be kind at any time. It doesn't need to be in response to tragedy, and and we should be. Um, and it it inspired me to want to teach my daughter. You know that that you can do that, um, uh, and, and wanted to be a better person, and just share the story. And they made us laugh, and they made us cry, and they're incredible out there. And so I, I think that that's why I, I feel like the show resonates is because we're celebrating um, that in all of us, and we're also celebrating that who they are. They remind us who who we are. That it's um, it's been life changing for us, and uh, and and we see people at the end of the show, like Gino said, we see strangers who have been sitting together stand up and hug each other. And we see them passing Kleenexes to each other. Uh, there, there were um, there were two women who came to the stage door the other night um, who had lost their husbands on 9/11, and uh, and one of our cast was there talking to them, and they said they said I want to I want to go to Gander, and, and and people talk about having a good memory, a memory of hope to associate with that day, not to replace it. And then um, this cast member, Sharon, it was Sharon. Sharon walked down and she met two women from Gander uh, who had come to see the show. And they come all the time and they wave flags and they're amazing. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and she said, I have someone I want to introduce you to. And she introduced the four of them. And by the time she left, they were friends and they were planning their trip together. And uh, it's, uh, it, it, it feels like you know moments like that, this event has the power to change things. Because you all went there to perform songs, didn't you? Did, did the whole show, a concert version of the whole show. Yeah. Wait, did you do it in Gander? We did, we did yeah, with all, with all of the proceeds going back to local charities, we, we brought an entire, we brought in a Broadway show to yeah. Gander, Newfoundland, which has never been done before. And, you know, it was, a, it was this uh, incredibly unique opportunity to introduce everyone to each other, to make Gino an honorary constable. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, but but beyond that, it was like we spent the entire yeah. time crying and laughing and. and uh, we, we talk about each of them individually, Beverly Bass coming to see the show and how, uh, how incredible it is to have your experience, your life reflected back on you, but to do that for an entire community yeah. with their culture and, uh, and, and celebrate them in a way that Newfoundlanders rarely get celebrated, it, it was amazing. They sang along with songs that they... There's a moment, we have a lyric in the show uh, that says, I'm an Islander, mm -hmm. uh, in the opening number. And as soon as we sang that lyric, they leapt to their feet and started <sighs> clapping and crying, and we all just <laughs> lost it. Yeah. Uh, it was beautiful. We, backstage, we were saying, we're not going to cry. Yeah. We're not going to cry. Yeah. We're going to yeah. hold it together. Yeah. together. And we we're sang... Opening like, number, done. Yeah, first number. <laughs> it's all over. Yeah. Because you were in the hockey rink, right? Yeah, yeah and the world's largest walk in yeah, they, yeah. I love it. They don't have a theater big enough for all of us yeah. in Gander, so we ended up doing it in the community 5, center in the hockey people, rink. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That must have been another life-changing moment it was during incredible. this whole journey for everybody, yeah. right? I think we all learned so much. Um, you know, getting to know as much as you can about the people you're playing is always ideal. Um, but more, more so for me, the, the spirit of that town and the spirit of those people and... You know, you walk down the street and people offer to give you a ride. I am, I was like, I do not know who you are. I, I don't think I should get in the car with you, Sarah, but. But we did. But, but where are you like, going? Okay, Tim Hortons, okay. I'll be there, you know. Um, but it's amazing because it is this, just getting to sort of like calgonate and be saturated in the, in the, the joy and the love of those people it was so inspiring. I think, I, I know for me, it really affected my performance, the depth of it. Mm -hmm. Just being there and getting to to absorb it all. And see, amazing. we're not overdoing it. Like, they are that kind. They are really that are. nice. We're not... Right. Sometimes as actors are like, oh, gosh, is this a little over the top? No, is the answer. Yeah. There were... Uh, when we arrived to the hockey rink, there were two workers there setting up the chairs, and I was wondering if there's Wi-Fi. And I t secretly turned on my uh, little voice recorder to get their dialect. And uh, it was so strong, I would do it for you, but I, 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 I fear that I will fail. Um, and it was awesome. And I was trying to get the Wi-Fi code, and they're like, oh, we're going to, we'll find it for you. And I was like, all right. And, you know, an hour goes by, hour and a half. And he's like, we got it. We got it for you. And I was like, that is the sweetest thing. And they were just asking around, and they were just really trying to help me out. It was the sweetest thing. For the cast, what is your favorite moment in the show that one of your other cast members sitting here does? Oh, God. All of them. <laughs> I mean, one of, it's just so amazing. I can't even pick one because just watching my 11 family members do what they do best every night is it's it's the best feeling in the world because you're, it's never a competition. Sometimes, you know, in this business, you watch them and you're like, hmm, I could do that better. You know, or the, they're phoning it in tonight. It never happens in our show. This is like the most inspiring, artistically inspiring show to be a part of, to watch all of these wonderful, loving people who are beyond talented. Uh, and I just, I'm black and blue pinching myself to experience all the moments every night. I like prayer. Uh, these three are, are prominent features in, in prayer. There's a beautiful moment in the show where there are several different uh, people from religious, varying religious backgrounds who are all praying at the same time, and the music is interwoven together, and it is stunning. I, I'm not a big prayer, but I pray every night. I'm just, I just uh, feel so, so grateful to be able to listen to you and to watch you and to feel that it, it's such a wonderful metaphor for what we need right now. So that's definitely my favorite moment. I have to say, at the end of the show, when I say, when Joel brings us all home, mm -hmm. um, yeah. when you make eye contact with us, I'm getting all acclimated right now. Um, he makes eye contact with us, and he sort of sums up what the show is about. W would you like to say your last few lines for us? <laughs> but it's, he Please means do, it. It's, it's from well, the depth of his the heart. Of the it's, just, <laughs> it's all from his heart, and it's just, it's moving, and I look forward to it every night, and it's, I just love it. It just moves me every single night. Yeah, because you mean it. You mean it, yeah. I think we all... Um, there is a moment where uh, we have what's called Costume Party. It's a song that we worked on and worked on and worked on and worked on and worked on. Never could quite get it right. And then we figured it out. Or they figured it out. <laughs> we all figured it out. And um, <laughs> when I sit down and I listen to in a crowded room filled with strangers, it hits me every night. And uh, mm -hmm. it's the universal feeling of being alone in the world. And it's a healing song. Yeah. That's 
beautiful. Thank wow. you for all of that. Wow. That's beautiful. Yeah. You know, you talked about your incredible fan base. You have a fan base of all around the world that have, have come to this show. And I was telling them upstairs, I just mention this on the street to people like, oh my God, I'm coming to see it. I've seen the show, I moved by it, or you know. And what is each of your favorite fan moment? Oh, my gosh. Uh, there's, uh, oh, okay, so uh, there's a one woman who has seen the show over 80 times. Last night was 80. Yeah. Um, yep. And she got a tattoo recently. <laughs> um, she asked me to write down some lyrics from uh, my solo in the show. And so she took that, my handwriting with the lyrics, and then a huge Come, we, uh, come From Away logo on her back. Um, uh, so that's a pretty big fan. <laughs> I would say so. There's a, we have a ton of amazing fans, and a lot of them are very talented artists. And almost every week, I feel like we're getting something from some fan somewhere. And there's this one gal, Emma, who did like these caricatures of us and gave them to us. And they are just the most beautiful thing. And she like made these beautiful frames to go around it. And it's something so amazing about when you look at the art, it's not just representative of the people, but it really is the essence of the people. She captured it, and she loves the show so much, and she paid attention to us so much that she captured every detail of all of us. It's, it's so amazing when, you know, because we all love musicals, but some people really love musicals and love this musical. And it's amazing when you feel that there's that much of a connection that affects people enough that they want to give you art back. And gratitude for your art, it's an incredible feeling. I think um, over and over again, when someone approaches me who lost somebody um, that day, uh, I'm, I'm always, you know, I'm always taken down a notch. I'm always, you know, thrown back a little bit. And, and they, and, you know, and, and this, this, this is one of my favorite moments, but it's also one I don't, I'll be honest, I don't understand. They always thank me for telling the story. Thank all of us for doing the show and telling the story. And, and they're so grateful. And I, you know, I'll be honest, I don't understand why, but I also, no, I don't understand why, because I'm not in the position that they're in. And, you know, and, you know, by the grace of God, I, I wasn't in that position and having lost somebody. So I've kind of learned to accept it and, and, and take the gratitude, even though I can't understand it. And kids. Sorry, I love, I love the kids. I love especially, like, the little, little ones who people are like, well, they're too young to understand. Um, Astrid Van Weeren told me once that the that there was a little girl at the stage door that was just staring at her and staring at her, staring at her. And finally, the only thing she came up with was, you helped people. And I was like, done. Like, <laughs> I can go home now. You have to keep doing the show, but I'm going home. Yeah. <laughs> Kids are smarter than you think, right? Right, yeah. right. Hey, uh, David, favorite fan moment. Uh, I'm trying to think of one, but I, I'm going to give I'm going to give a shout out to our uh, our ushers and our amazing team there. So uh, w one of the things that I've learned along this process is that ushers are always artists who are who love theater and want to see it over and over and over again. And I remember in um, uh, in Toronto. Uh, I realized halfway through, I was like, you guys have seen this a million times, and, and you're really smart. And, and I said, what drives you crazy about the show? And they gave me a couple little notes, and we, <laughs> and we got them in. But, but also, when, when they love the show, and they have seen it hundreds and hundreds of times, and they write on Facebook that they love the show, and they, you know, and they, and they connect with us, and they're always happy to see us, that, that's, that means the world to us, because, uh, because they don't have to. You know, and, to, and often, they tell us shows that they don't like. You know? um, but, but it means the world to us that they're fans of our shows as well. Yeah. They're also the ambassadors, right, of our theater, of our house. Yeah. They are literally the first handshake, the first greeting when people are coming into that house. So I love that they are um, so genuinely on our side. I like that. Oh, and it was, so we also have a, this, is, this isn't a fan moment of us of fans coming to us, but we have a tradition with the show of, uh, that we started in Toronto of uh, one show. We, uh, we go out really early to the, um, to the lineup outside the theater, and we bring donuts and coffee, and, uh, and, and we performed in the dead of winter in Toronto, and it was <laughs> yeah, almost froze. So they start lining up at like 3 in the morning. Yeah. For, for standing rush room, tickets for and, rush tickets tickets and yeah. standing room. Yeah. yeah, and we did it here as well, and uh, and met people from Japan who had come to see the show, and you know from everywhere. It was really, it was really cool. Favorite fan moments down at that end. Gosh, I've been racking my brain over here trying to figure it out. The fans of our show, and it's you know even that word fan is just uh, I don't know the, the the people who love our show. I mean they're they're amazing. And there have been so many experiences. Honestly, I'm trying to figure out one. Last night was amazing. Yeah. I'll just do that one because that's on the forefront of my mind. 
um, there's this thing I do at half hour where in my dressing room, me and Sharon share a dressing room, and I open the dressing room window, and it's such a beautiful view of, you know, 43rd, what street? 45th, 45th Street. <laughs> Lord, and you can see all of the shows, and um, so I open the window and I talk to Broadway. They have no idea that I'm talking to them. And how do you say? It? Can you say the word again? You talk to oh Broadway. That's B R A H W A Y Broadway. Broadway. And uh, <laughs> so I open the window and I just sort of sometimes read them a poem, an inspirational quote. I'll tell them about an audition I had earlier that day, theater etiquette. And I'm just talking out there and waving. And this Jen was uh, doing something for Broadway World, Broadway World, right? And uh, Broadway.com, the blog, Broadway.com, yeah. yes, where she had to carry around a camera and sort of videotape things that were going on backstage for the audiences. And she came to the dressing room one day and was like, "Kim, what are you doing?" And I was like, "I'm talking to Broadway." And uh, it got posted. And from that post, people love Jen Colella. Obviously, they're just like reading up on her. And so. There are people that wait outside now and like wait for me to wave to them and stuff. And I'm like, this is so crazy. It's so exciting. Um, so there's a guy named JT last night who saw Astrid walk in the door and said, can you please tell Q that I'm across the street waiting for her to wave? Hi, JT. I hope you see this, honey. Um, and so I did. And we talked. Jen came and joined us and was doing sign language across the street and talking to all the fans. And, and then he walked me home and we just sort of had a great conversation. He's a good kid. Yeah. I think I did mine. Didn't I do mine already? I could do more, though, if you want. <laughs> no? I, we, we had, a, um, like, a week or so ago, this uh, group of women whose um, husbands died in the World Trade Center. And one of them said to me, um, you don't understand, long after you're done doing the show, long after it's closed on Broadway, it's still going to resonate with people people who experienced that day and that hit me you know harder than than a lot of things that have been said that's beautiful you know we have a lot of actors in the house today and watching and people who write musicals and write plays and you know at different ages maybe thinking of switching it all out i mean you were a an actress first, right? Yeah, became absolutely. A writer. Yeah, yeah. So I want to ask all of you first, what was that defining moment for you when you said, I have to be a part of this business. I have to either be a writer or an actor and try to make a living at this. Do you remember that defining moment for each of you? I was in first grade. <laughs> I did a show and I just, I, my mom always says I said this, I don't remember this, but I did this, that's like the, the fir tree, some sort of, you know, non-denominational holiday, you know, pageant. <laughs> About a, about a Christmas tree that gets chopped down, but it, I don't know, whatever happens. But, huh? I was the woodchopper's son. Thank you, Jen. Yes. Um, the, the pivotal role, the woodchopper's son. Uh, but I, no, I came off and, I, and I, I apparently said to her, you know, people laughed at me and people clapped for me. I want to do this forever. And so I have the same reasons now. I really want people to laugh at me and clap at me. Uh, no, thank you so much. Thank you. It's all worth it. It was worth it. No, but that translated as, as I kept growing up. I mean, it sort of started from that very superficial place of, you know, wanting acceptance. But there is that feeling of, like, I have something that I get to offer people that they really, they actually like to see and even pay money to see. This is a good thing. And it's just such a blessing for me to be able to, to share anything with people and have them, um, you know, receive it so joyfully. So I, I knew early on that I wanted to do it. I wasn't sure if I knew it was actually possible, but I knew I wanted to. For me, I think it was about 11th grade. I started pretty late. I was very interested in archaeology. I thought I was going to be an archaeologist or a teacher. And uh, I went to see Les Miserables on tour. I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. And I was just slowly getting, getting introduced to musical theater. And I went to see the show. And my parents came with me. I was like, you got to see this show, you know. And they're like, all right. And so they sat there with me. God bless them. They're amazing. And I turned to them and I said, I think I want to do this for the rest of my life. And they're like... Okay. And Les Mis turned out to be my Broadway debut. Um, and I just, it was a dream. I would sign in at half hour crying, get on the A train from Harlem, like, I can't believe I'm going to work. I can't believe it. Uh, but it was a dream come true. But if I was born a little later and saw this show for the first time, this would have been the show for me that would have made me do musical theater, do theater. I didn't know until quite a bit later. Uh, I, was, um, I was thinking of being a minister. And I worked in a, a Lutheran church in northern Minnesota after I was done with college. 
And there was a little opera company that was formed, and they did um, Martha by Von Flotow. And I was the baritone, second comedy couple baritone singer. And I'd always sung, but I didn't, hadn't really done theater that much. So I really loved it. I really loved it. And um, I saw what the minister had to do at the church I was working at, and I didn't love what he had to do. <laughs> I mean, talk about bad reviews. It's tough. And uh, so I thought, you know, this sounds like something I'd like to do. And um, then I went and got a graduate degree in that. Great story. Um, my, my story is similar to Gino's. I was in this school show called The Small One about the donkey that took Mary to Bethlehem. <laughs> And you played? I was the auctioneer that auctioned off the donkey oh. and had to stand. I know you love that role, right? I had to stand on like a box because as opposed to the monster you see before you now, I was really small. And they handed me a mic this size that took up my whole torso. And I was like, $20, give me 20. Who's going to give me 20? Who's going to be the one I want to hear a $20 bid? And I, something in me, stu I was like, oh, I'm good at this. This is something I'm good at. Uh, right? Yeah. And I remember seeing my mom's face like, wow, she's good at that. And I was like, I got it. I got it. <laughs> that was the moment, the auctioneer. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, David, for you. I think it was hearing Jen be an auctioneer. <laughs> <laughs> we all want to do that, right? Um, uh, my mom used to take me to, uh, to folk festivals and, and theater a lot, so I, I always loved um, doing that. And I used to be a singer-songwriter for a long time. Uh, I, but Irene and I started working together as writers uh, for the first time uh, because we, uh, we were between day jobs and night jobs, we never saw each other, and we were married and we missed each other. And so we thought, why don't we put on a fringe show uh, and we can at least spend the summer together and see each other for once. Um, and the show sold out and got picked up by Canada's biggest producer. And we had to quit our day jobs. And suddenly we were uh, performing and writing and musical theater writers. And, uh, it's, and now we spend every single second of the day together. And it's <laughs> awesome. That's great. Um, I think for me, uh, uh, there, was a, there was a review show at Canada's Wonderland called The Best of Broadway. And actually, Sergio Chihilo was in it. And we, um, so we bonded over that because he'd seen the show like the year before, which, and then he decided to become a dancer. And then when I saw that show, I decided to become a dancer. And so we've totally bonded over that experience. I used to like, I used to sit in the audience for every show and memorize the choreography. She still knows the I choreography. Still I could bust it out, but I'm not going to. <laughs> I see a dancing career coming up, too, for you. You know, we have a lot of actors, like I said, auditioning. I know it's the hardest thing. Some people like to audition. Some actors don't like to audition. Do you all like to audition? And do you have a horrible audition story? Because you're all at the top of your game right now that everybody here can realize, if they can get through this, I can get through this. Oh, Yeah. Uh, mm. Yeah, I mean, it's a necessary evil, I always say, because auditioning is... I don't know. We're always, you, a lot of people grow up uh, in theater or, or you know, get out into the world and think it's a, it's a competition because in a way it is. I mean, you're fighting for a job. But at the same time, I was taught that it's, it's you getting to share, you getting to perform, even if it's for two minutes and it's 16 bars. Those are your 16 bars to share with those people. Um, that's your monologue, your one-minute monologue to share with those people. So it kind of takes the pressure off of it. I mean, even though end of the day, you got to pay the mortgage or whatever. But still, if you can think of that preparation and that time in that room with those people as sharing, as joyful, as you're doing what you want to do, at least for two minutes. And hopefully it'll lead to doing it for you know, many years in the same show. But um, I think this, that, that mindset sometimes is what gets in a lot of people's way. There becomes, and it becomes so desperate, and you just start sweating, and you're just, I need this job. You know? <laughs> so I think that, that change in mindset can be a very powerful um, you know, healer in a, in a way of you thinking of it so differently, and it's a more positive experience, as opposed to the necessary evil that it, it can be for people. Did you have a horrible audition? Yes, many, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I did a, See? I went in, my favorite one, <laughs> um, I was auditioning for this uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber Music of the Night tour that they did. It was sort of like the best of Webber kind of thing, and so it's like, you know, 9.15 in the morning, and which is a great time to sing. And of course, I go in to sing Music of the Night, which I was like, I rock this song. I feel really good about this, right? And so I sing the first verse, awesome. It has this nice floaty. Well, you know, it's like, I nailed that first verse. Second verse, it goes to this big A flat at the end of it. And I yodeled like the Rico look. <laughs> Where you long to be? But I held on to it thinking, I'm going to get this back. I'm going to get the note back. And I didn't. And they said, you know, I think you've got that note. Let's try it again. And I said, oh, God, here we go. 
yeah, yeah, again. And I didn't get that job, which was weird. I, it was weird. It was so weird. Oh, well, maybe next time. Uh, I used to be so fearless. Like, I, I, was, I couldn't even believe that I was able to live in New York. I never just dreamt that this little girl from Nebraska would end up living in New York. So when, when I did get here, it was quite uh, baffling. I was like, I can't believe I'm here. Let me just, let, let's just go for it. And I was, I was, I loved auditioning. And not to say that I don't anymore. It's just that uh, I am less fearless these days when it comes to auditioning. Um, but when I first got here, it was, it was an amazing thing. Um, I loved auditioning so much that I went to this audition. Remember Colony Music? Mm -hmm. I was working at TKTS, passing out flyers. That was my first job here. And a friend was like, oh, I'm headed to this audition. You should come. And I used to love, love, love auditioning. And I was like, all right. I had on like a pair of shorts and like a tank top or something. I was like, OK, I'll come on my lunch break. And I'll just I'll go to Colony Music and I'll just pick up some music. <laughs> and so didn't have a headshot or anything, you know, non equity. I was like, I'm on my lunch break. I can do this. And so I grabbed, I was like, what can I grab really quickly? It's $2.50 for sheet music. And I grabbed Under the Boardwalk. And I was like, I remember just like singing this song like all the time in my house. I could totally just like sing it. Just grabbed it, didn't look at the key or anything. <laughs> yeah, 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 mm-hmm. So get there, go in my shorts and my tank top. And I'm like, hey, everybody, hey, I'm here. <laughs> and uh, give them the sheet music. And in my head, I'm just like, oh, when the sun beams down and burns the tar up on the roof. Right? That was in my head. He started playing, like, somewhere in some other key. And I was like, is that the right key? OK. <laughs> OK. Yeah, this is OK. Oh, when the sun beams down and burns the tar up on the roof. <laughs> and, right? And it just gets higher and higher. So <laughs> by the time it gets to under the boardwalk, I like, I say, here we go, Jesus. Oh I grabbed God. everything out of the air and I go, I'm the boardwalk! <laughs> Just screaming. And I was like, thank you. <laughs> and this I is the best question ever. <laughs> the worst audition oh. ever. But I still do enjoy auditioning. I, I do, actually. I love telling stories. But as long as it's in your key, right? Oh, Lord. <laughs> I, I, it, it, as far as enjoying auditions, I love auditions when the material is, I really feel a good connection with. And you don't always know that the material is going to be right for you mm -hmm. until the night before when it gets sent to you by your agent. <laughs> And you go, yeah, I'd love to audition for that. And then you read it and you go, oh, boy, I, oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. <laughs> so um, I went in for um, The Last Ship. And here comes the name drop. Did I drop something? Sting? <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm doing a song for him that I'd sung a million times. Knew it backwards and forwards. So comfortable. So in my wheelhouse. And I start, I'm doing the first phrase, and I look and I'm like trying not to look, but I see peripherally Mr. Sting do. <laughs> and I lost it. <laughs> Every lyric that ever was in my brain for any song was gone. <laughs> so that was that. Was that. I, I, I wasn't in The Last Ship, if you noticed. <laughs> I've never heard of anybody's audition going so well that then they lost it. Like, that's amazing. That's actually amazing. It was, it was insane, wow. but I, I couldn't recover. Oh, no. I, um, I, I'm, I don't love auditioning, but I think I'm getting better as I, I get older and more comfortable in my own skin. Um, I try to treat each audition as like the first day of rehearsal. Uh, like we're doing a table read and this is how I've worked on the material and here's where I am so far, mm -hmm. um, which takes a little bit of pressure off of me for myself. Um, so here's an audition where I did not do that. Um, <laughs> I was auditioning for Kathleen Marshall and I was singing, uh, it, was, it was a hot summer day and I was singing Little Deuce Coop 
and um, I had in the chicken cutlets, you know, to help me out, right? Uh, if anybody doesn't know, that's just some, some boob enhancers. And, uh, and so, warm summer day, as I'm singing, one of them starts to slide down my... So I had to just hold it like this, but then I thought, I'm just gonna keep it there, it'll look dumb if I, so I'm singing, and I just keep it there, and I think, well, that looks silly if I just have one, so let me get the other one. <laughs> so now I'm a little bit of a T-Rex. <laughs> uh, and she wants me to sing another song, so I'm like, great, excellent, I've got another one, let me just get my book. <laughs> so I, oh I start to sing, don't rain on my parade, and I get to the, I'm gonna live and live now. Get what I want, I know how. One roll for the whole shebang. One throw, that bell will go clang. I am the target in flower. Leave flash, leave on, tell your mom. Like, I just missed the lyric. I suck the lyric. And then I, that's right. And I stopped and went, I think I had a stroke. And she said, I think you did too. <laughs> I was like, see you at the callback. Ah, ah. <laughs> Did not get that job. Oh. <laughs> now, where do you two go from there? <laughs> Someone stepped on my toe at a dance call and broke it once. That's all I got. It was not funny. <laughs> I was not cute about it. Oh That's my it. God. Yeah. Uh, I. I will say just that uh, auditioning these guys it is <laughs> it never went like that. <laughs> they were all brilliant. Uh, it's actually a really fun audition process for this. Chris Ashley is is um, brilliant and really giving in the in the room, but also he's really playful. And because everyone has to play a million different characters, uh, he will literally say, uh, you know, all right, can you try it again as a Russian cheerleader, you know, or as. <laughs> Texan, Duh. you know, thug or something like that or yeah. something like that. And, and it, from our perspective behind the table, it's been really fun. Yeah. I'm sure it's, uh, you know, horrific for you guys, but, but, but it actually feels uh, uh, like, like a really fun oh. experience. And, and, and a lot of it is, you know, can you sing the right notes? Can yeah. you, you know, could you fit into the slots that we think we figured out for the show? Uh, but then, then they leave and there's a whole conversation about has anyone worked with them before? Uh, can, can we make phone calls? Are they nice and are they good people? And uh, and what it's and I think it's a really integral part of the process because it's it's created this wonderful family who's um, you know everyone we work with is really great people who we're proud to be have our show represented yeah. by. Those stories were incredible. You see, here are people at the top of their game, award winners, and look at some of these horrible <laughs> audition stories they've had, and they are in the biggest hit on Broadway. So you know it just. I just... will bomb another edition again no, for I, sure. I think. <laughs> That is hilarious. We have an audience question, which is really beautiful. The question is from Mike. He said, first of all, thank you for the most wonderful and beautiful show. And the question is, as Americans, humans, and artists, what can we do in this ugly and diverse landscape to continue the message of this beautiful musical of Come From Away? Anybody can take it. Be kind. Yeah. Practice it. Practice yeah. it with yourself first. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I have literally had to make a a conscious effort at home. Like, it used to be if I knocked over a water glass, I'd be like, oh, you idiot, right? Really tough on myself. Not just as an artist. I, we're really tough on ourselves as artists. But as a person, you idiot. These names that I would call myself. And now I'll knock over a glass. I'm like, you're not an idiot. You've just knocked over a glass. And conversely, if I knock something over and catch it, I'm like, ninja. <laughs> right? Like, we have to get into the habit <laughs> of celebrating ourselves, and then it's a lot easier to celebrate everyone else. Hold the door for people, look out for people. Um, I ride a little scooter around town because I'm a 12-year-old boy, <laughs> and, um, and every, I trained myself when I started riding this thing nine years ago um, to switch legs, first and foremost, so I didn't have one massive thigh. Um, and secondly, um, I say to myself, look out for everyone else. 
I trained myself that every time I step onto it, I say, look out for everyone else so that I'm not just somebody who's moving through the New York streets and trying to get where I need to go, but watching out for everyone else. And then I spend my day doing that, keeping my heart open peripherally so that I can see if someone else needs a door open or if they drop something or eye contact or a smile. It goes so far. We have to be the ambassadors of, ki of kindness so that we can make this change in the world. Beautiful. I think what, one of the things we learned in Washington, D.C. Uh, was, this was before the election, um, but, but even now, uh, you know, we had a bipartisan audience on opening night, and everyone applauded the show and celebrated the show and celebrated this little town that uh, opened its doors to strangers and, uh, and people being good to each other. And what that taught me is that we have so much more in common uh, then, then divides us, and uh, you, you look at the story of what happened in Gander with these people bringing 7,000 people into their town and their t population doubling and not having any idea what their background is, but knowing that in that moment we were all in it together. And, we, and they found a way to work as a community, not just the locals giving, but also the people who were coming off those planes. They had every right to be, to be jerks and to be angry, and they didn't. They worked with the people there, and they're... Uh, we, we there, you know, the message from there is that there, there's so much that kindness and understanding and reaching out across the divides of race and religion and regional differences and anything that can accomplish. And it just feels like that's one of the reasons the show feels like it resonates right now is because we're it's so divisive right now. And uh, it feels like we need to remember that, you know, we have we have uh, you know many of the people that we interviewed are uh, you know have different political beliefs. We have we have different political beliefs within our within our group, and yet we all celebrate this, and, and there's so much that we agree on, and it feels like if we can start there, there's a, there's a world that we can change. Beautiful. I think they did it brilliant. Yeah, they did good. <laughs> they did good. How has being a part of Come From Away changed the way you now live your lives as humans and as actors? I feel like, um... I'm just forever changed, and I. This is an experience that I'll take with me um, for the rest of my life. Um, I feel like it's opened my heart. It's opened my mind. It's like you know, as as actors, we can be pretty selfish. We have to take dance class. We have to take voice class. It's all about perfecting, you know, your art, you know. And I'm trying to live my life just trying to perfect myself. Well, I'll never be perfect. None of us will. But I'm trying to just sort of live a life that is worthy of, of living, which means, you know, helping other people, like Jen said, which means um, loving yourself and which means just sort of doing something like the small things is, is like a ripple effect, right? What you do now can affect um, your tomorrow and the next person's tomorrow and that person and so on and so forth. Um, and the show sort of has just went like this and my eyes are like wide open now, right? And I breathe differently now. I just take every moment in stride. Um, I don't let one moment pass me by um, without being grateful. You know what I mean? I, I live this grateful life and um, I take that into the audition rooms and I take that um, when I'm reading scripts and it just sort of takes the pressure off. It's like we've been given this gift to tell stories, right? Right? It's such a gift. And so I sort of lead with my heart in that way instead of leading with my art form, you know what I mean? With my technique. I just sort of lead with my heart, and I think that's really opened the doors and really um, changed my perspective on how I approach a character, how I approach a show. Um, and I just want to live my life grateful and open at all times. Yeah. I think I'm in big trouble the rest of my life because this show <laughs> is the most special experience of my life. Joel and I have a moment backstage before we go on for that prayer sequence Jen was talking about where we will often just look at each other for, for a hot second and just be like, we're so lucky, you know? We, we have the little moment where you can talk about the audience or how's it going, but we just nine times out of 10, 9.9 .9 times out of 10 say, wow, we are spoiled rotten. Yeah. What are we going to do the rest of our life that will <laughs> ever be like this? Um, so it, it's, it's that kind of show, it's that kind of experience for us. We talk about the audience and the fans, but for us, I think I can safely say it's the most special thing ever. And it's gonna, it's gonna make it hard, you know, the rest of our, our careers, but, um, but it doesn't How make it any less special. How has it changed you, Gina? Has it changed me? 
Yeesh. Um, I have an almost two-year-old son who was... He is cute. Thank you, cute. Um, so he was in my wife's belly when we were doing the show at La Jolla. Um, and so he's kind of grown up with the show and, and, and the experience of that. And it makes me want to be a better person and artist in this world for my son. I think anyone who's a parent can, can attest to that. It changes how you want the world to be now and in the future and what you want to leave behind uh, and trying to be a good person, trying to be a kind person, not just for the world, but also specifically for this one part of the world that I get to leave behind. No pressure, right? So that's an amazing thing for me that this show is tied in so intrinsically to my son and now the way that I want to raise my son. I think um, there's a misconception about actors that we are um, sleight of hand artists that uh, can manipulate audiences and tell them things that we don't really believe. But the only way to really be effective as an actor is to find the truth. And when you tell <laughs> this sort of a story, um, it affects you. Um, you realize that you have to live with that truth. Um, you have to, it has to be a part of your life, otherwise you aren't telling the truth. And I think that's all affected all of us. Um, I, I think for us the change probably really started when we were out there in 2011 do, doing the interviews. Um, and, uh, you know, and I, I learned that there's, there's a difference between being being nice and and still like and still being careful like i mean it's not it's not like you're not cautious but there's but there's just sort of a jadedness that's gone and um and and as jen says it is a practice like it is it's i mean especially practicing you know like as a as a woman in new york who walks home at night or whatever like you 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 learn to practice like you know when is it appropriate to be nice and open and when and when do I have to guard myself and it, it, it really is different it, it really is a different thing and a different practice to start to learn those sorts of those sorts of things um, you know and we, when we after going out to Newfoundland we have this house in Toronto and whenever we would leave we'd need people to watch our cats and and we just reach out to our community and be like who's in a place of transition who who could really use uh, a place to stay for a couple months and two really loving cats. And then that would just be it. That would be the way we would pass our, our house on. And we totally learned that from people in Newfoundland. And my gosh, it's, it's, we had like over 10 people stay there now. And it's, it's benefited us and it's benefited them. And, and it, it's, yeah, it's, it's changed the way we look at everything. It's become a part of your life now. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. This, uh, when, we, when we first talked to our producers about this, we had two goals uh, beyond just trying to put on a good show. We wanted to give back to the people of Newfoundland in some way, and, and we've tried to do that time and again. Even from the first workshop, we raised money for Bonnie for her SBCA during kitten season and uh, passed the hat, and, and, and we continue to do that and try to give back in, in a lot of different ways. And we also wanted to pay it forward. There's a character in the show um, uh, based on a real person, Kevin Turf, changed his company around, and uh, every September 11th, uh, he would close his company, uh, give uh, give each of his employees a hundred dollars and, and tell them to go out and good do, go do random good deeds for strangers uh, inspired by the people of Newfoundland and, and so we as a company have started doing that as a tradition on September 11th and uh, and both of the countries Canada and America have declared it a national day of service to one another so I, I think there's something um, to what to what Jen's saying to what we're all saying is that you know not only can that day and should that day be about spreading kindness, spreading joy, spreading goodness through the world, but every day can be like that. And, and yeah, I, I, I try to think about that. Yeah. Beautiful. There's another question from the audience, um, someone by the name of James. He wants to know what you two look for for people auditioning for this show. There's a lot of actors in this house who will be watching this around the world. You have a, a few productions. Talk about the productions of Come From Away that are coming up next. Where, you, where do you go next? Uh, we go to <laughs> Winnipeg, Manitoba. Yeah. Uh, and we go there in the winter, and it's going to be awesome. And, um, <laughs> and then we move to Toronto. Wonderful. Um, and that's, severe, that's, that's, our, that's our second company, yeah. and, uh, and we've just cast it. Uh, and in the fall of 2018, we're going to have a North American tour, which has not been cast yet. So, so congratulations on that. Thank so you. what do you look for for actors who want to audition for Come From Away from you as creators? Uh, honestly, you know, I, I, 
they, they're the whole Texas cheerleader, Russian thug thing. It doesn't matter to me if yeah. you nail the Russian thug, but if you like just, you are, you really think that you've nailed the Russian thug and <laughs> and you're just like, right, you go, sure, jump right in. Okay, like it's it's like, oh my gosh, I had a, <laughs> I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to name drop somebody, so, somebody that no one knows, but our teacher, Kate Ashby, used to say it was like the hokey pokey. You got to throw your whole self in. Yeah. And that's, that's exactly what we look for. Yeah. Like from the, from the minute people walk in the door is that they're just, they're just completely there. Yeah. They take direction. They're willing to play. Um, it yeah. It also feels like, it, it, like we have a life's too short policy. Yeah. You know, if, if, I don't care if you're yodeling or if you're a T-Rex. If you look like you're fun and we're going to have yeah. A, yeah. a good time. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the, you know, and the, I mean, certainly there's a lot of, you know, truth, you know, what Joel was talking about, about, about we're looking for, you know, not, not this, this musical theater is, has a wide range, uh, you know, and you can, it can be really broad and it can be really grounded. And, and we tend, especially because we're trying to honor real people, we're, we're looking for people who are, who are bringing that groundedness and that truth and their own experience to it. Yeah. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, but, and, and then there's also the playfulness of being, jumping in and let's just, let's just try it. And then, and then we do look for, uh, we, we try to find people who have worked with you and say they're a really good company member or they're really good to work with. And, and if you can tick all of those boxes and be able to, you know, fit the, fit the parameters of the role, that's, that's great. You know, and at the same time, it's, it's, it's uh, like, like it's fun being on the other side of the table and it is agony being on the other side of the table because there are so many amazing people uh, and it is, it is a horrible, horrible uh, decision and uh, we, we don't like that part, but, but getting to play with these guys is fantastic. And, and sometimes we will, especially if we don't know somebody, we will troll Facebook and Twitter a little bit. So just be aware. Just, I mean, really, if you have, if you have to make yourself known about how you feel about every single Broadway show, have a different handle. Don't use your own name. You know, like just, like it's just professional people look at your at your profiles. So interesting. Yeah. A lot of, we, we hear that a lot now that people look back at something. So change your name to like Chorus Girl number one or yeah. Cassie Pop Your Head number 10. Yeah. I've already exactly. got, I've got that one already. <laughs> <laughs> that was you? No. That's him. So my final question is in this ever-changing business that we call show, what is the best bit of advice that each of you have been given throughout your life, either personally or professionally, that you live by? Either someone from a teacher or a parent or just something you live by. Who wants to go first? Wow. It's a big question. I, it's, I, it's the same one that I give to my students, um, is you are enough. To trust that you are enough. You don't have to try to emulate someone else. Uh, and especially for the younger actors, there's nothing on your resume that should be there. There's no note you should be able to hit. Um, where you are right now is exactly right. And the more you can embrace where your two feet are right now and that you're doing the best you can as an artist in this moment, uh, it's going to make it a lot easier. Um, so you are enough is the one for me. Uh, enjoy the ride, I was told mm -hmm. once. Because really it is, it's a, it's a ride. It's like a roller coaster. There are going to be ups and downs and lefts and rights and you don't always know what's coming. You may think, oh, this is, this is going to be horrible. It's a loop-de-loop. -loop. That was actually fun. I didn't <laughs> know it was going to be fun. So it's that sort of being open to enjoying it and knowing it's a journey. It's not about getting to the end of the ride. You want to enjoy the whole ride. So that's important for me to try to find the joy in every moment and be open to all of the goods and the bads, the ups and the downs. It's not always easy, but it's important. I used to read the uh, Martha Graham Agnes DeMille quote every day. Um, oh my gosh, well I can't. The, but it's, it's very similar to what Jen was saying about um, uh, there's no one else like you, and if you and you need to express yourself as you, and if you don't, then it's just going to be lost. So you you have to do it. You just have to. And you're never going to be satisfied, but you just have to keep going. It's basically. And it's not your job. Yeah, that's my favorite part. Is it's not your job to judge yourself or anyone else's work. It's just your job to to be you and do the work. Yeah. I've totally bastardized that quote, but it's out there. <laughs> uh, I love Gina, like the, the living in the moment thing. That, that's really, that, that's, that's made a huge difference for us. And also, um, uh, you know, cliche is doing things that scare you uh, is so valuable. You yeah. get to the end of it and you're like, wow, I really did that. And I feel like, I feel like uh, you know, every day, you know, just, just blank pages scare me. 
a little bit, you know, and, and, but you just, you just start writing and you're like, look, I wrote something or you're coming into the rehearsal room and being like, I hope they like it. And uh, you know, it, it like, it, it's, it, this business is scary and, and it's so rewarding to get, to get past that and to remember that as you're going into something and be like, this is probably going to be awesome at the end of it. It's scary right now, but. Um, there are a couple of things. Um, my dad always says, did you pray today? And I'm like, yes. And you know, prayer can be small. It can just be being grateful, walking down the street. Oh, I'm so grateful for the sunshine. That's a prayer, you know what I mean? It doesn't have to be always about what you want. You know, oh, I so want to book this gig. A prayer is just being grateful and acknowledging that there's something working for you and for us all as a unit, you know? A divine force pushing us forward. So that's a prayer. He's always saying, did you pray today? And he always says, it's not how you start, but it's how you end, right? So just because you fall today doesn't mean that uh, tomorrow's going to be a bad day. You know, just keep going and make sure your life counts in the end, right? Um, so that, that, and then lastly, my voice and movement teacher from Ithaca College gave us pencils that said breathe. Mm -hmm. And she would, always talk yeah. about, she would always talk about breathing. And it took me years to find out what that meant. And I so get it. I so get it. One of my best friends called yesterday. She was having a hard time. The only thing I could think of to tell her was to just breathe, right? There's so much involved in that. Um, that's a journey for you if you're interested in what that's about. That's a whole journey for you. But breathing is, breathing is quite important. I am um, going along with that. Uh, a, a, uh, a director once said, if you're not thinking about your breathing, you're probably thinking about something that's going to get in your way. And I think that's really, really valuable. Um, um, several thoughts. Um, comfort is highly overrated. Um, if you haven't figured out a way of having fun with your part, it's too damn hard to do. Um, so figure out a way of having fun with what you're doing. And... Um, uh, uh, I was working on a role once in which the director said, Joel, Joel, you're a nice guy. Everybody here knows you're a nice guy. That's not the point of your, of your acting here. You're here to tell the truth of your character. And if that's not exactly pretty, we're just going to have to live with that. But you're going to be fine at the end of the day. The audience will still like you. And um, I think sometimes we just have to give ourselves permission to be as ugly as we need to be to tell that story of that particular character. And that's not always easy for us. Did you finish yours? I started. I, <laughs> I, I know you did. Well, I, first of all, I have been doing this for a long time. I want to thank you for one of the most insightful and joyful afternoons Aww. that I have had. For those of you who have already seen Come, and For Come From Away, you know what you're gonna, you know what you've seen. For those of you who have not seen it, go see this incredible musical. You will have the time of your life and your life will be changed to Come From Away. I thank you for taking your Thursday Thank you afternoon. so much, Sweetie. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the company of Come From Away.